So this past Wednesday evening, Jewel and I went to New York to see Richard Strauss's opera Electra at the Met. Strauss is an incredible composer. He's not my favorite, but he's right up there. He's in second place for me. Strauss writes exquisite music, but in this opera, he wrote terrifying music. This is music which will make your blood curdle. Because the story is an adaptation of the Greek myth of Electra, the tragedy of Electra, written by the great Greek playwrights Sophocles and Euripides. It was adapted for Strauss by his longtime collaborator Hugo von Hofsenthal. The story of Electra was a favorite, as many of you know, of Sigmund Freud, who posited an Electra complex as the female equivalent of the more famous Oedipus complex. Electra is also the subject of a pretty polarizing 2005 spin-off film in the Marvel Cinematic Universe. Even if you're a huge Jennifer Garner fan, I don't know if I can recommend the movie because, like I said, the reviews are pretty mixed. For more on that, you can discuss St. Mark's resident Marvel expert, Rob Schwartz, our administrative coordinator in our office. 203-966-4515. Pick up the phone. Rob will give you an opinion about Marvel. Thank you for this, Rob. The story of Electra, Jennifer Garner or not, is simple enough to follow, even if it's gruesome. Electra is one of the three daughters of King Agamemnon and Queen Clytemnestra. To appease the goddess Artemis, the goddess, the Greek goddess of hunting, King Agamemnon has to sacrifice one of his three daughters, Iphigenia. Agamemnon does so, because if he doesn't, Artemis says, you're going to lose the Trojan War. Agamemnon chooses to win the war and to sacrifice his kid. In retaliation, Queen Clytemnestra and her lover, scandal, and her lover murder Agamemnon after he's returned from the Trojan War. The story goes that they actually, they, 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 they struck him down with an ax while he was taking a bath. Again, HBO has got nothing on the Greeks. There is nothing new under the sun. Now Strauss's opera, Strauss's retelling of this Greek myth opens not with the murder of Agamemnon, although that's kind of depicted in the music. It opens with Electra stewing over the murder of her father by her mother. Maybe Electra and the daughter that was sacrificed, maybe they just didn't get along or something like that, but she seems to have moved on from Iphigenia. Now she's just upset about Agamemnon's murder. She's stewing over it, and she's vowing justice. More exactly, she's vowing revenge. A servant remarks that Electra has the eyes of a feral cat, and that her hands are twisted like a vulture's claws. Electra is a person possessed, not by a demon, but by despair. She vows the murder of her mother and her mother's lover, after which she cries ecstatically to her father, Agamemnon, when they are dead, we will dance around your tomb, and over the corpses piled high, I will lift my hands, and everyone who sees me dance will say to each other, such a royal dance of victory. I mean, it's really gruesome, but it's like a car accident. You can't look away. It's shocking what's consuming this family. Electra's last living sister, named Chrysothemis, tries to dissuade her from this scheme, begs her to make a long story short, to get a life, in the fullest sense of that phrase, to get a life. Chrysothemis says, why don't you come with me? Let's leave this place. I want to meet somebody. I want to get married. I want to have children. Why don't you come with me, Electra? And Electra says, no. She says, I cannot come with you. I will not come with you. I've got to get justice, AKA revenge. Now to make a long story, Shorter, Electra and Chrysothemis' brother, Orestes, returns from hiding and succeeds in murdering Clytemnestra and her lover. Okay, so the brother comes in and kills the mom and the mister. Now the latter of whom, okay, 
Clytemnestra's lover, in one of the scariest scenes of the whole opera, is crawling across the stage. He's not quite dead yet, right? He's been struck down, but he's not quite dead. He's crawling across the stage and he's crying out, help, murder, does no one hear me? Can no one hear me? To which Electra replies, Agamemnon can hear you. Ugh. I mean, oh my gosh, it's terrifying. It's terrifying. Afterward, Electra, as promised, jubilantly performs her dance. The libretto says it is a nameless dance. Nameless or not, it's not pretty. Okay, her body is contorting in spasms like this. Okay, it's not beautiful ballet, and it's set to a demonic sounding waltz by Strauss. Her sister Chrysothemis tries one more time to beg Electra to give this up. Stop dancing. Come with me. There are people outside, okay? We're going to have a party. Please come to the party. And Electra says, no. She says, dance on. The burden of joy I carry. Whoever is as happy as we are can do nothing but this. Dance. And then after a few more contortions of her body, the libretto says that Electra falls lifeless. Dead. That's how the opera ends. Dead. Smack. So the modern, the more modernized uh, production of this that Jewel and I saw on Wednesday interprets this death at the end of the opera as a spiritual death rather than as a physical one. I have to say, I kind of prefer the Met's older production uh, where it's a physical death, okay? And so Electra's like spasming like this and then just goes, bang, right on the floor, prostrate. Either way, the meaning is the same. Electra's joy is the joy of revenge, and the joy of revenge kills her. She didn't start the mad cycle of violence which consumed her failing, excuse me, but which consumed her family, but in her refusal to end that cycle of violence, that cycle of violence ended her. As Father Peter put it when I brought the opera up in our weekly podcast, Revved Up for Sunday with me, Father Peter, and Reverend Elizabeth. Electra is the un-gospel. It is the negative image, almost to the letter, of our reading from the gospel according to St. John this morning. In our reading, Jesus appears to his disciples who've been hiding in the same upper room where we, where we found them on Maundy Thursday. They've been hiding in the upper room in which Jesus had gathered with them the night before he died. The doors are locked, it says, because the disciples are afraid. Jesus appears in their midst, appears to a group of his sometime friends who had abandoned him just days before. And what are his first words to, him, to them? Peace be with you. Not, I can hear you. Not, how dare you. But peace be with you. The Greek word here for peace is irene, from which we get the English word irenic. Irene means more than just peace of mind. It doesn't just mean to be calm. It's a state of harmony or concord among people or even within an entire society. It's also the peace and the prosperity which come from that state of harmony and concord. Jesus' use of it harkens back to the theology of Shalom in the Hebrew Bible, where shalom means a peace and wholeness which includes the whole created cosmos. St. Paul refers to this peace in the thick sense when explaining what the cross did in his letter to the Colossians, saying, through Jesus, God was pleased to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, by making peace. Irene Poesas, making peace through the blood of his cross. The idea is that God in Christ throws a cosmic wrench into the cycle of violence which has afflicted humankind since the murder of Abel by Cain. And God does this by mysteriously taking all of that violence in, by taking it on the chin and then refusing to retaliate by unleashing, instead of revenge, 
resurrection. Jesus rises victorious not to murder those who had killed him or to haunt those who had abandoned them, but to say, peace be with you. And this is much the point of our reading's last line about the fact that these signs are written in the Gospel of John in order that we might believe that Jesus is Lord and that believing in him we might have life in his name. It's not so much that the Gospel of John is giving us a set of ludicrously far-fetched stories of miracle and magic to which we might intellectually assent, but rather that John hopes that by encountering the risen Christ himself in the recounting of these events, in recounting these signs and wonders, we might be swept up in the same awe as the Apostle Thomas, when Thomas said, my Lord and my God, swept up in that same awe and peace which is unleashed by the Lord in that moment, and that we might spend our lives chasing the Lord and chasing that peace. That's what it means. I think, to, when John says, through believing, you might have life in his name. See, part of the lesson of the resurrection appearances is the same as the lesson of Electra. Sophocles and Euripides and von Hofsmanthal and Strauss got it right, just like the author of the Gospel of John. Life and death are not just physical realities. They're emotional, social, and spiritual realities. And love goes with the grain of life and revenge goes with the grain of death. And Jesus' resurrection in the fullness of his being, body and soul, resurrects forgiveness, love, and peace with him, defeating death in every sense of the word, and not just one. By refusing to pass the buck of violence one more person down the line. This resurrection appearance is not about a set of unlikely propositions concerning the existence of God or the facticity of the empty tomb. It's an invitation to choose life rather than death in the hope that we might end up like the disciples and not like Electra and her family. To forgive someone, I think, is to put yourself in the flow of God's own life. It's to put yourself in the flow of the resurrection because it is to try to Comport yourself toward that person in the same way that God does. To orient yourself toward that person the same way that God is oriented to them. That is to try to love them unconditionally. Notwithstanding whatever wrong or harm they've done. The ritual sharing of words of forgiveness like, I'm sorry, I forgive you. These can be precious, tangible signs of that love. They're important. They're incredibly helpful, but they're not necessary. A lot of people ask me, can I forgive somebody who doesn't know that they're wrong or who has never said, I'm sorry? The answer is yes. Refusing to forgive somebody, it said, is like taking poison and expecting the other person to die. Forgiveness is as much for you as it is for them. And you can forgive them by putting yourself in that divine flow, in the flow of resurrection regardless of how the other person feels. It doesn't depend on them accepting your forgiveness, nor does it depend on them changing their behavior, nor is it even a one-time decision made at a particular hour of a particular day, right, oh, okay, I'm going to forgive this person and then it's over. Forgiveness is a spiritual state. It's the state of the soul. It's the life into which we're about to baptize Ava. The fruit of forgiveness is peace, irene, in the fullest sense. In that state of harmony and concord and perfect reconciliation is achieved by God in the fullness of time, Paul suggests, I think. We may not experience the fullness of it in this life. He promised to us in the life of the world to come, but it may or may not be here in its fullness now. In the meantime, the choice before us is whether to close ourselves off to the possibility of that peace in this life or the life to come. And we can close ourselves off to it by seeking the cheap justice of revenge instead. Or we can open ourselves up to the possibility of reconciliation someday, somehow, by God's grace.
by foregoing retaliation, by foregoing revenge. Forgiveness in this sense of op being open or closed to the future, to God's future for you and whoever has harmed you, it doesn't mean that you continue to subject yourself to the person's harm. And this is really important. I want to slow down here. Because especially in extreme cases of harm, such as abuse, it's very important to remove yourself from the company of the one who's done you harm. To protect you, often to protect your family or someone else whom you love. You can remain open to God's future for you and for that person. You can forego retaliation and revenge while also keeping yourself safe. Keeping yourself safe does not compromise the spiritual state of forgiveness which puts you in the flow of God's own life. Sometimes forgiveness restores a relationship to what it was before, and sometimes it really doesn't. What I think forgiveness consists in across the board, and I think it's very difficult to talk about specifics of forgiveness without thinking about particular cases, particular circumstances. That's why I just, I hesitate. If you have something that's on your heart, how to forgive a person or what is it gonna look like in my life, I hope you'll come to me or to Reverend Elizabeth or to Father Peter and talk to us about it or talk to a trusted friend, one of your siblings in Christ who's right next to you. I think that the circumstances of our lives are incredibly complicated and what forgiveness looks like concretely can differ based on what exactly you're facing, what your needs are and so on. But what unites all forms of forgiveness is this openness to God's future, this openness to reconciliation by foregoing the cheap justice of revenge. And in that sense, we are all either adoring the wounds by which Jesus has made peace between us and God with the Apostle Thomas, or we are dancing with Electra. We have two choices in this life, Easter or Electra. I pray that we all choose wisely. Amen.